Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the April 2022 meeting of the board, uh, board meeting of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Quite a mouthful at first thing on a Tuesday morning, but it's the MHRA. My name is Stephen Lightfoot. I'm the chair of the, the board, and my role is to lead us through today's agenda. So, for those of you who've not attended one of our board meetings before, I must start by saying that this is a board meeting held in public, and it is not a public meeting. Having said that, we will provide the opportunity for some questions and answers at the end of the session, but we won't be uh, allowing any, in, in, sorry, any contributions during the meeting uh, so that the board can complete its business first. So it's also important probably to explain the role of the board and the MHRA board in particular. So this board, the people that we're going to introduce to you very shortly, are responsible for the strategic leadership and the corporate governance of the MHRA. And I'd like to emphasize that this board does not make any regulatory decisions on any individual medicines or medical devices. It's also important to emphasize that the way that regulation occurs is that ministers ultimately make the decisions on the advice of the independent civil servants or the officials within the MHRA. And they're also supported by an independent expert advisory group, you know, the Commission on Human Medicines uh, and other expert committees too. So anyone involved in making regulatory decisions is not allowed or not permitted to have any interests or direct or personal in the pharmaceutical or the medical technology industry. So we work very hard to ensure that regulatory decisions are made completely independently, and that's really the purpose uh, of the regulatory agency. Now, as far as today's meeting is concerned, this is a meeting of the MHRA board, as I said, responsible for the strategic leadership of the agency. We'll be recording the meeting so that, and also live streaming it so that as many people can uh, observe it as possible. Now, on that note, I'm particularly pleased to say that 110 people have registered to observe the meeting live, and that's actually a record, so we're very pleased uh, at, at that indeed. We've actually got 60 people representing the public, patients, and patient groups. We've also got 27 people representing industry, seven health professionals and government officials, three journalists, and also 13 members of our own staff. So welcome to each and every one of you. Now, with introductions in mind, I'd just like to start by going round the table to introduce all the uh, colleagues that are with me here today. So as I said, my name is Stephen Lightfoot, and I'm the chair of the board. So June? Good morning. My name's June Rain, and I'm the chief executive officer at the MHRA. Good morning. I'm Rachel Bosworth. I'm director of communications and engagement here at the MHRA. Good morning, I'm John Fundry, Chief Operating Officer. Good morning, I'm Raj Long, Non-Executive Director of the Board. Good morning, I'm Graeme Cook, I'm Non-Executive Director and Deputy Chair of the MHRA Board. Good morning, I'm Mercy Jair Singh, I'm Non-Executive Director and Chair of the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee. Good morning, I'm Laura Squire, I'm the Chief Officer for Healthcare Quality and Access. Good morning, Haida Hussain, Associate Non-Executive Director. Good morning, I'm Helen Lovell, Deputy Director for Medicines Regulation and Prescribing at the Department of Health, um, representing the department today. Good morning, Junaid Bajor, Non-Executive Director of the Board. Good morning, Mark Bailey, Chief Science and Innovation Officer. Morning, Mandy Calvert, Non-Executive Director and Chair of Organisational Development and Remuneration Committee. Good morning, Paul Goldsmith, non-executive director. Good morning, Alison Cave, chief safety officer. Good morning, Michael Whitehouse, non-executive director and chair of the audit committee. Good morning, I'm Natalie Richards, I'm head of the executive office. Great, thank you colleagues, uh, very much appreciate that. So you should uh, all have access to our board pack for today's meeting, and I'll use that and the page numbers uh, in the board pack to keep us all on track and guide us through the agenda. I'll also assume that everyone has read the, uh, the papers so we can spend most of our time on discussion rather than presentation. As I said earlier, although this is a, not a public meeting, we will provide the opportunity for members of the public uh, to ask the board any questions they wish. However, in recent months, it's become apparent that we've received far more questions than we can answer within the 30 minutes that we've allocated for this session within our two and a half hour board meetings. So from this month, we're, we're only going to be answering questions in the meeting that are related to the substantive items on the agenda. 
but we will answer all other on, uh, all of the questions in writing uh, as, as we would uh, do normally anyway. So the audience can ask questions during the meeting using the chat function on Zoom webinar. Uh, and again, Rachel Bosworth, our Director of Communications, um, will actually collect those questions and will answer as many of them as we can uh, live uh, in the question answer session at the end of the board meeting. So that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Can I just check if I've missed anything? No? OK, that's great. So that being the case, then, let's move straight on to the agenda. So that's obviously on page number one. Um, I've hopefully explained the purpose of, of the meeting uh, and who the board directors are. In terms of absence, we've had apologies from Glenn Wells, the Chief Partnership Officer, Claire Harrison, the Chief Technology Officer, uh, and three members from the devolved administrations. The Alison Strath, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer for Scotland, Greg Chalmers, the Head of the CMO uh, Policy Division in the Scottish Government, and Cathy Harrison, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer for Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, this meeting is clearly conflicted with the Easter summer break, uh, Easter holidays break with schools. So I think that's as far as the uh, absences I'm aware of. Everyone else is, is clearly present. In terms of declarations of interest, so if we just move to page number three, we can see there the, the list of declarations of interest. Um, Paul, I think you've got a, an additional one you wanted to mention? Um, yeah, just to highlight, Closed Loop Medicine has an ILAP application. Perfect. And that's been already noted within the, uh, within the declaration there, so thank you for that, Paul. Um, can I also just, just by way of sort of good practice, looking through the board papers and anticipating where there might be perceived uh, conflicts, mm -hmm. In the CEO report uh, on paragraph 2.5 on page 21 of the pack, it mentions some research work on po polio eradication, but it also mentions funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and collaboration with Imperial College. So, um, so Raj, can I just check if you had any involvement in that funding from Gates? No, I haven't, Chair. Okay, thank no you. Involvement. And Graham, have you had any involvement in that work at Imperial College? No, no. Yeah. And, and also, during the, through the, throughout the um, CEO report, there's a number of mentions of NIHR, that's the National Institute of Health Research. Graham, I know you've uh, got a declaration as a professor uh, you know, associated with NIHR. Can I just check that you've got, had any involvement in any of the items that are mentioned in June's report? Uh, no, I'm involved in a, a different long COVID project, but not the one working with CRPD, that, uh, CPRD that's mentioned. Okay. So on that basis, then, I don't, I don't perceive there to be a, any conflicts of interest that would mean we'd need to exclude Raj or uh, Graham as far as those agenda items are concerned. Is everybody content with that? Okay, thank you for that. And Raj, I think you had an additional declaration you wanted to mention. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to inform that I'm no longer supporting the Huyo Bioscience that was previously declared. Okay. Thank you. So that, 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 that particular interest is now closed. Thank you. If we just make a note of that, Natalie, that would be great. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so if we just move on to the minutes of the last meeting, um, so that moves on to page number uh, 12, I think it is. Can I just check there if the minutes themselves are, in fact, an accurate record of the last meeting? I'm seeing nods around the table. So on that basis, can we therefore approve the minutes as an accurate record, please, Natalie? That would be great. In terms of the, uh, the, the actions at the end of the minutes there, uh, there were sort of four items in red that were due today. So if I just quickly pick up each of those. Um, so item number 58 was an update on the MHRA and Department of Health framework agreement uh, to coincide with the change of trading fund status. Carl is unfortunately not able to be with us today, but uh, Helen, can I just ask you to give us a verbal update on where we are with the framework agreement? Certainly. Um, we are in the very, very final stages of drafting after some, some very um, excellent work between our organisations. Um, it will then uh, be going for final clearances, including with Treasury. So we're not completely in, in control of that timescale, but it should be finalised very, very soon. Good. OK. Thank you for that. Um, on item number 65, there was an action for PSEC, that's the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee, uh, to review safety risks, and that's included in your report, Mercy, so we can come to that later, yes, if that's it is. okay. Yeah. Uh, item number 76, uh, ensuring that uh, the monthly financial income and expenditure reports versus budget are available for every cost centre manager. John, I think that's partly picked up in Michael's report, ARAC report, uh, about saying there's going to be a manual workaround to provide that information. Can you just confirm that's the case? Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the case, Chair. So 
Um, we've produced the budget, which will be coming to later yep. in the agenda, um, on the new organisational yep. structure. So that's in place. Uh, and for the first probably three months of the year, we'll prov be providing the normal management pack yep. uh, on, a, on a manual basis, thereafter automated. Great. Okay. And uh, do help yourself to a drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then finally, item number 77. June, it was, there were some uh, questions we couldn't get to after the 30 minutes at the last uh, meeting. Can you just confirm that all the questions have been answered? Happy to confirm all the questions Correct. have been answered. Okay, so I think from my perspective, everything that is due is actually therefore covered on the agenda or has been completed. Does everybody concur with that? Yeah. And were there any other final issues or items from the last meeting that anybody wants to raise? Great. Okay, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that very much. So let's move on to the, the first major item. It's on page number 16. It's what are our most important activities and priorities from the CEO's point of view? June. Well, thank you, Stephen. This report up to April on our current activities and priorities really highlights the immense breadth of work, public health work that the agency undertakes through science and regulation. And I'll just highlight one or two messages, as it's quite a long report. Yep. The first one is about our dynamic organisation. And the report comes at a time of really intense activity as we put in place our new teams in the structure launched back in January. And we've been building these teams right across the agency, science, research and innovation, healthcare quality and access, safety and surveillance, with the aim of our permanently employed staff being given the appropriate roles or opportunities to take those up by the end of this month. So intense activity underway there. And of course, all this depends on our infrastructure support being in place, our new partnerships group enablement and the corporate functions. So it is our number one priority, our dynamic organisation. And we're very much now looking forward to the benefits of this product life cycle model as it delivers for the NHS yep. and for patients, particularly as we look to re-engineer and refresh our services, but also our tech roadmap. And uh, as we'll talk about later on, the fees that will be needed to be reviewed to enable all of this. Of course, our focus on healthcare access is a key deliverable. And uh, you'll have noticed just before Easter that our work to deliver new products for COVID does continue. Uh, a new vaccine, an inactivated vaccine for the first time, um, and also authorised using immunobridging, which takes us a step towards the 100 days mission to be able to respond nimbly. And in fact, uh, we've got a new pre-exposure prophylaxis product for people who can't mount an immune response. So a lot of work there. And I think it's time to also record that our scientists have approved certificated 220 million doses, which is not just for the UK, clearly worldwide. Um, I would like to highlight in relation to other medicines, Project Orbis for cancer drugs, the project led by the coordinated by the FDA, and we've seen a new product coming through for a specific type of non-small cell lung cancer. And this is, I think, evidence of how that collaboration is very, very productive. I'll highlight our clinical trials legislation. I know it's a matter of great interest to everyone here. Huge response, probably the biggest response we could have imagined, over 2,000 uh, replies that we're distilling at the moment. But importantly, we joined with the Health Research Agency and the National Institute for Health Research to really publish a major commitment to be more inclusive to take trials to underserved populations. And that's going to be a real thrust of this new legislation when we deliver it. Finally, patient safety is always a top priority. Colleagues will have been concerned to read about sodium valparate again over the Easter weekend, and I just want to confirm that it remains a priority for this agency. We'll be connecting directly again with the patient groups who've supported us through our network with all stakeholders to keep driving home the message that no woman in her childbearing years should be on it unless she's on effective contraception. A quick word, I think, not to leave it unsaid, that the devices safety issues are a major uh, activity. That uh, ventilator that uh, had an electrical fault was promptly removed. And uh, you'll have seen note, an insulin delivery pump. These are high-tech products that needed to be 
uh, reviewed. Our devices expert advisory committee is going to be put on a statutory footing as we look again at our strengthening of safety systems in that space. And I'm delighted to say that an interim or shadow committee is being set up as we speak. So, Chair, our three key areas are transformed agency, our work on innovation and healthcare access is really gaining momentum, and of course, patient safety is always front of mind. I'll stop there, take any questions. Great, thank you, June. Well, again, <laughs> always in t continue to be impressed by just the sheer breadth of uh, responsibilities the agency has. So thank you again on behalf of the board for all the work that the uh, officials in the agency are conducting. So colleagues, can I just ask if there are any immediate questions for June on any of those aspects? Oh, unusually quiet. Okay, well I've got a question then. Oh, m Mercy. Just got a comment, so it's not really a question. Yeah, go for it. So um, I, I just um, wanted to highlight that wonderful phrase on time and on budget in 3.1 for Safety Connect. So that was delightful to hear, and I'm always uh, happy to hear that. But I also just wanted to um, comment really on on the fact about all the good work that's going on in the agency, considering. Um, all the disruptions through transformation and, and that. So uh, just to really congratulate the staff um, for delivering, uh, keep delivering on, on patient safety and, and the things that we need to deliver, really. So, um, yeah, so I want to pass that on to, my, on to the staff. Great. Oh, thank you, Mercy. I think, uh, I think we'd all share that uh, particular view, and I think uh, this report demonstrates that. Huge commitment throughout transformation, absolutely unwavering to get doing the right thing at the right time. I think the phrase in relation to our technology refresh is one we hold very dear on time, on budget. Um, on Safety Connect, as colleagues will be aware, it's a complex project that is needing a, an element of replanning given the number of providers we're engaging with and the aspiration for a very responsive system. So it's groundbreaking and we'll bring back to the board some element of reprioritizing of the various elements that hopefully will start delivering uh, later in the year, but maybe with more ambitions realized in a programmed way. Great. Okay. Paul, I, th I think you had a question. Um, again, two observations. I mean, first of all, the international work is great to see, and hopefully we can do more of that and more engagement. And the other thing that, that was mentioned in the report which I think has been really, really important over the last month, is a Goldacre report, um, which dissects in a lot of detail all of the challenges in the um, UK health ecosystem with regards to data. Uh, and it could be transformational and very important for MHRA and something I think we need to revisit. Mm. OK. June? A very welcome publication, particularly the focus on trusted research environments, and we have strong aspirations in this area to fulfil that altruism that everyone wants to make the important and best use of clinical record data while safeguarding confidentiality. We'll be coming back, as you know, Chair, in a couple of months, um, might even be next month, yeah. but uh, we'll, we'll uh, be clear that we have a very comprehensive approach to yeah. the regulatory contributions as we seek the realisation of this immense resource that we're mm. privileged to have here. Okay, thank, thank, thank you for that. Michael. Yes, um, I really want to echo um, what Mercy said, a uh, very impressive report, and also to draw attention to the fact that um, Safety Connect got uh, the highest rating from internal audit about its um, overall controls and the likelihood of it delivering the results. So I think that's a really good message to, to receive. I, I suspect my question is, um, as a layman, I see here um, the advances that we're making with the innovative licensing and access pathway. And then we also have the research that's been done in clinical trials. And clinical trials, the message coming back is that we need to be doing, or that the industry needs to be doing more for under-served um, groups. And I just wondered, that will take more time, I suspect. Is it possible to balance that demand with what we're trying to do with um, ILAP? I mean, it's a real challenge, and, and June, I'd welcome your, your views on that. Well, Michael, you're quite correct to highlight this is a, an area of tension, but I think it can be very productive tension. Um, in Mercy's group, we've looked carefully at how, in the toolkit, as we call it, the patient group mm. involvement from the outset is vital. I think that the 
opportunities we now have, particularly with wearables, uh, that other med tech advances that mean attendance at a hospital, for those that are perhaps resource constrained, isn't always necessary to be in a trial. So taking the trial to the patients is a principle, and I believe that in ILAP we can embrace both that need for, if you like, promise being realised quickly and taking the, the, the trial to the patients can be delivered. But it's helpful to have that priority articulated here mm. and we'll make sure that the ILAP team colleagues are well aware, possibly bring back some more facts around that because yeah. I suspect when I talk in principle uh, mm. we need some facts to back that up. Yeah. Thank you. I welcome that assurance. Yeah. And, and, and Mercy, just bringing you back into the conversation, if I can. Obviously, that, I know that's something that you've discussed at the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee in terms of diversity of uh, you know, trial applicants uh, and how we can encourage that. And, and similarly, Paul, I know you've mentioned that on more than one occasion as well. Is, is there anything else you could maybe add to that? Well, only that the, um, the clinical uh, trials consultation that's gone out, um, we're getting report to, to uh, the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee um, on the responses uh, to that. So um, hopefully we'll have a, a closer look about yeah. who we've reached and who's responding to. Yeah, great. No, yeah. And, and Paul, I know, I know you feel very strongly about the uh, inclusion uh, in clinical trial environments. So any, any further thoughts from you on that? Um, it, I mean, it's one of the good things about CPRD that it mm. um, is overrepresented for uh, disadvantaged communities. And I think the SPRINT project as part of CPRD being able to sort of randomly reach those groups is really really exciting if we can is why it's so important that project um ex exactly the same issues in the u.s so um last week fda were publishing on this and how they need to reach uh, the underserved communities as well yeah okay so that's clearly a priority so with the you know the clinical trials consultation having come to an end there's an opportunity to review the processes there uh, and, and come back with a formal proposal of how we can actually make that systematic within uh, any clinical trials regulations that we choose to uh, uh, introduce yeah okay uh, Junaid just a quick comment on trials I think we often think about trials and almost automatically think about secondary care but the role of primary care within trials and the role of primary care through CPRD and thinking about how we leverage PCNs and the emerging infrastructure that we have in primary care and strengthen our relationship with primary care through MHRA around trials, around quality, I think is also be a massive enabler in this and perhaps something we could pick up, Mercy, in your committee as well. Yeah, yeah. and just thinking of pri uh, PCNs, you just explain a primary care network. So primary care networks, primary care operating at scale, uh, minimum size about 50,000 patients coming together under a GP clinical network yeah. and thinking about how you could think about quality improvement and practice at scale, practices supporting practices, supporting patient benefit at the local level. Yeah, so again, it's, a, it's another dimension rather than just a single GP practice. The GP clinical networks that exist Absolutely. are a great opportunity there, I think, particularly for clinical trials. I think that's a very helpful suggestion. Um, Raj. I really like the idea, June, of bringing sort of digital health to patients, which will take the clinical trials closer to the patients. But I think we also need to be cognizant of the fact that in doing that, the tools that you use need to be validated for consistency and specificity and sensitivity often. So it does indirectly also means the devices area of the agency has to be, you know, it's, it's additional area that they need to look at. Uh, if, so it might be useful if we are going down that strategy to actually prioritize what, to, what components of these wearables or mm -hmm. digital tools you want to do and focus on prioritizing that so that not only do you bring those tools in for public health care, but it also becomes indirectly an asset for clinical trials. Yeah. That's a very good point. Um, the consultation on the medical device legislation did indeed give a huge priority to, we understand that the NHS itself, all the opportunities of remote monitoring for clinical care itself, um, is, a, is an important priority for us to ensure we got the capacity yeah. to do the work to ensure that these uh, new opportunities, the med tech um, wearables, etc., are validated and uh, in the way that Raj mm. has said. So regulatory standard setting, capacity of approved bodies, and uh, that being a key element of our new legislation. But I think the dimension we're now highlighting for clinical trials itself is a priority within a priority yeah. if we're really to succeed in the ambitions. Yeah, that's great. Graham, I think you had a point. 
Uh, sort of related. I, I mean, I was pleased, pleased to see that there's been more engagement and more opportunity to engage with international bodies around trials and, and get feedback. I wondered what the feedback was from the US in particular about the changes that are being proposed, whether there's going to be more alignment internationally in regulations as a result. The um, update given was uh, around a particular meeting, which is obviously good to catalyse thinking and alignment, mm. but we see that the expert group we've set up at the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities is really important because that is a piece of work that will look systematically at alignment mm. so that international protocols um, can be rapidly um, adopted and not requiring a developer to do sequential applications, etc. It's a big learning from COVID. So while the report itself says we're making one step, I think it's a systematic piece of work as we go through our own clinical trials legislative refresh yeah. that we bring on board the international community um, to the thinking. And uh, just finally, we're not omitting mention of ICH. We've got our observer to full member application yeah well under review. Yeah. So there's and a number of strands to this work, but the international compatibility is going to be vital mm -hmm. for our patients, for our NHS. Yeah. And, and, and just again, ICH, June, just for... The International Conference on Harmonisation yeah. that's done sterling work over, mm -hmm. well, quarter of a century, I think. Yeah, exactly. But now we need to build that learning capability from COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the virus moved, so the trials need to move. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a strong understanding of the need for that international harmonisation, you know, where it helps the multinational studies in particular. Uh, Heyda, I think you had a point. Um, just a question, really. Um, and, and uh, June, thank you for a really comprehensive and, um, and detailed report. It's always amazing to see the, the breadth and depth of um, all the activities that the agency is, um, is doing. Um, my question was around the one agency uh, leadership group, which I think is an excellent uh, initiative. Um, and how you see this developing to um, address some of the concerns that were highlighted in, in the staff survey, um, especially interested in the fast decision-making one, if you think um, a group like that will really be empowered to, uh, to help us address, address that. Really glad that uh, this is so clear to the board that this is the key, the powerhouse that will deliver vision into action for the agency. Um, we had a really successful meeting in March that brought together all our new senior leaders and some who are actually in interim positions who were all obviously so keen to do exactly what you're saying, Hedda, is to get the benefits of the new organisation. So it's a monthly group that we're distilling work packages, one, the decision making, uh, there are others around our culture, leadership, behaviours, etc., to give everyone the tools and the ability to be the leaders of this mm. new organisation. So it is, I won't, you know, you know uh, admit it's not there yet. It's a work in progress. But delighted that this is now becoming the focus for delivery that we want it to be. And the ambitions are being aligned and the work is coming together. So I make sure that it's part mm. of our monthly report, actually, because... I think board members will want to know how those conversations are going. Quite honestly, they are honest. <laughs> and that's what we would expect. Um, we've reached that point in our transformation where nothing but absolute honesty about where people are and the steps we need to take to get to that uh, benefits realisation phase are, are becoming increasingly clear. Thank you, June. That's great to hear. And, and again, June, just, build, just building on that, the, uh, you know, the, the benefits of transformation, um, how well understood do you think they are within the, within the agency? And is there a, a point of just reminding ourselves what the key benefits of transformation are and why are we doing all of this work? Absolutely. We can't say it enough times mm. that the opportunities we have through the life sciences vision emerging as we are from COVID to make the UK a fantastic place in the world to yeah. develop and introduce products that will benefit our patients and our NHS. And that coming together in this really, if you like, clear model of a product life cycle enables us to move away from some of the silos that weren't actually very helpful and start to work across yeah. the agency in a very much an outcome focused way. So that's the vision that we have the opportunities are here now, and 
that's what gives us the energy to continue to, to look for great examples. The best thing that was said to me just about a week ago, quite spontaneously by a member of staff actually in healthcare quality and access, is we're all talking. We're talking much more than we did before across the boundaries and coming together. I think part of it is a legacy of COVID, yeah. but the opportunities for us as we become mm. a cohesive one agency are, well, fantastic. Yeah, yeah I think it's very, very, very easy with organisational change. We know how hard it is, but actually we've got to stay focused on why we're changing and it ultimately is to enable scientific innovation, it's to accelerate healthcare access, and it's to strengthen patient safety. And I think we just need to stay really <laughs> true to those ambitions, and then working in partnership and with patients at the centre of everything we do. So I, th I think the model works, and actually with our recent external engagements, June, it's become quite clear that people are starting to really understand that, and we just need to help to support our staff through this period of uncertainty. Uh, to get to a point where we can deliver exactly on those promises. Well, perhaps, Chair, as the board's, you know, kind of focusing on, we have to walk and talk yeah. at the same time. A summary about the ten top points, yeah. I think, is something everybody could have in their pockets. Because yeah. I think it ought to be a natural yeah. rather than a, oh, I've got it somewhere in a document. And I think we can make sure that everybody has got that to hand. Yeah, great. And Graham, you want to come back in? I mean, I think the idea of having a regular update for the board is, is great, and that would, be, that would be good. I think one of the things we discussed before was about having an update on a number of vacancies, which I think has been highlighted. So if, I don't know if that could be part of it. That would be quite helpful as well. We're going to have a report um, very shortly on yeah. okay. the great. eagle eye of the <laughs> <laughs> organisational uh, development and remuneration committee. But yes, it's very much a daily, mm. daily discussion. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Mandy, do you want to go add something? <coughs> Well, it's, it's, again, that tension between operating yeah. a more measured cycle, perhaps, of an annualisation, as we do for flu, that our scientists understand so well, but the ability to nimbly respond. Mm. And uh, as we all know, particularly from the work on the wastewater, we're not yeah. out of this yet. It isn't over. And uh, the combination of work that will alert us, particularly through our scientists and uh, our cross-government working means that that 100 days mission is very much in mind. That's not just for vaccines, it's diagnostics and therapeutics too. And that's why the recent vaccine approval is so important on immunology mm -hmm. type of data rather than waiting for very large trials. But the nimble response means a rapid trigger and an agile implementation of the same cross-agency uh, kind of working. Okay, that's that's really encouraging, and again, this cross working right yeah. through the life cycle, really good example. Oh, that's, that's that's great. Um, I had, I also had a question, and uh, maybe I could maybe bring Laura into this one actually, because uh, in section one point nine, it talks about uh, the medical licensing and some of the ways we're reviewing some of our processes, and it talks about a do and resolve group constituted to focus on uh, improving the, uh, you know, the, the uh, presumably the efficiency of our application processes. I just wondered, Laura, if you wanted to just uh, give a, a brief update, because I wasn't sure what, exactly what the Do and Resolve group was, was actually doing. Well, the, the Do and Resolve, thank you, Sarah, and I think the, the Do and Resolve group is about um, variation. So yeah. we're sort of doing, we're doing a couple of things at the same time at the moment. Um, so we are, well, obviously we're transforming to yeah. the new structure. But there's also overlaid on this, which makes it quite interesting, is, is a couple of years of prioritising COVID and the impact yeah. of that. And so there is something about how we recover our performance to pre-COVID level, levels and then kick on to get yeah. it even better. Yeah. So um, the, we've, we set up do, do and Resolve groups to look at areas of particular difficulty in, in terms of backlogs. And this we started with, with variations to try and get those through. And some of that, very simple things they've done, like just 
pooling work yeah. because we have found with lots of the changes, I mean, we have had an awful lot of changes and people leaving, some of them because they stayed longer with us to get us through COVID. Um, and that means that some allocations have sort of been left, so pooling and then, then making sure that we're doing things in date order and those sorts of things and looking for pragmatic solutions. And the Do and Resolve group um, have really done some good work on variations and hopefully people are starting to see that now. Um, on, on the uh, certainly on the type two variations that are coming through, but that is going in parallel yeah. with our sort of more strategic. Okay, so how do we change the processes more fundamentally in order to get our long term kick on? But separating the two, I mean, keeping the two in touch with each other is quite yeah. a sensible thing to do because you learn from yes. each, and so that's that's what we've been trying to do on that. Yeah, I, I think I think that's great actually because one of the messages we've heard loud and clear from the trade associations is about the predictability uh, of our licensing performance. You know, and, and I think actually we've clearly exceeded all expectations when it comes to some of the COVID applications. But actually, there's there's a lot of other products apart from just COVID that we're dealing with. So. Yes, and we we have on that on that front we have started now with the established medicines to move forward from us having ideas to start to have more detailed conversations with trade bodies. Yeah. Um, and that's been quite useful to bring out the perspective around things like why they need a long lead in time and yeah. why certain things, there are some of our ideas that actually probably won't work so well, but mm. um, it's starting to go into the co-creation phase, yeah. phase, which is really helpful. And, and, and this is really important to maintain supply uh, of, of important medicines to UK patients Completely. and also to give UK patients access yes. uh, to, to new medicines as, as, as early as possible. Yeah. So, so there's a real per patient benefit in this as well. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So understanding NHS demand is really, really important because that yeah. should feed through to our priorities. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, colleagues. I think that's been a useful discussion, but also very comprehensive. And, and, and so, June, I think, again, just want to, I think, note your report with great thanks to you and also the entire agency team um, who've actually sort of continued to work incredibly hard uh, during a, a pressurised period of change and also uh, you know, external events like COVID uh, and, and everything else as well. So... Thank you for that. Okay, that being the case then, I'd like to move on to the next item, and uh, that will be patient safety. And so, Mercy, you chair the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee. Um, so we've got an assurance report from you on page number 26. You can assume we've read it, but what are the key points you want the board to be aware of? Uh, well, I'll, I'll do a, a very quick summary um, and um, highlight that we actually covered... Uh, four areas in our last meeting, which was at the beginning of April. Uh, the first was on consultations. Um, now, we're having more and more consultations as the agency changes. Um, and it was really for the committee to kind of consider what we need to see as consultations go out, because um, obviously there's so many. I think there was 15, I think, in the, the last, you know, kind of um, year or so. Um, and there are more, you know, coming through that there's, it's really not possible for us to have a look at every single yeah. one. So we really needed some principles and standards that we want to, to go across all consultations and this was a chance for the committee to uh, review that um, and uh, think about um, what kind of information do we uh, want um, consultations to gather for us so we can really um, kind of uh, assure the, the board that consultations are, are of good quality and, and that we have a systematic way of kind of picking up um, information from them. And also that we learn so that we um, have consultations that are um, not just a good quality, but are reaching the right um, audiences as we've been talking about as, as well. Um, and um, so we were talking about the, the register of information that we get back of it. How do we learn as an organisation? But how do we keep flexible as well because um, we don't want to be too rigid and some of the good ideas that came up was um, also recording things in pro formas so that mm. people um, before as they plan a consultation they're kind of really looking um, at the kind of information uh, that they need to be gathering um, but also kind of assessing well what's this consultation for what's the impact going to be um, you know I think that should always be a mm. step one um, because every time we go to consultation we're asking uh, the public and patients to give up their time and their effort, you know, to help us. Um, and it's really important that we, we do that appropriately and we, we um, you know, use the information they give us as well. So, so that was um, quite important. Um, so that 
uh, principles and standards will come back to the committee once once that's been developed a bit more. Um, and then there was um, uh, an issue about complaint handling because the Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman who can review MHRA complaints are changing the definition of the complaints that they cover. Um, before it was just administrative uh, complaints but now it's also um, services um, that are covered um, and that's really quite important for us to to relook at our complaints uh, process. Um, so we had a, again a, a very open discussion about kind of uh, standards, what we want to, to see in a, a complaints process um, and actually we did adopt the definition from the PHSO um, for you know the standards covering not just administrative but services as well um, and we we also looked at uh, what it's like from a patient point of view or public point of view about so, sort of saying well what system do I use yeah. if I want to make a complaint um, so that was really important so um, that kind of distinction for for um, the public but also for our own staff to know what system to use so yellow cards uh, for instance the yellow card system on, on adverse drug reaction could be seen um, as a complaint um, but it's very distinct about we we want to know um, about um, issues that are, arise through the taking of medicines, which could be quite different from administrative or yeah. other services that we offer. So getting that clear is important. And then as a committee, we wanted more information coming back to us about the kind of complaints that were coming in, mm. um, how quickly they were resolved, what, what the resolutions were, and what learning uh, could the organisation as a whole um, take from those complaints. Um, so uh, again, that's in development, and uh, as it develops, uh, the committee are going to be kind of um, sent updates, really, uh, mm. as as we go through that, which is is quite good. Um, I'm I'm going uh, then on to uh, the uh, yellow card biobank, and uh, which we uh, it's been going on about 15 months so far, and and uh, the yellow card biobank is really this kind of quite amazing, I think, um, new uh, research project to learn about why um, people are, you know, have adverse drug reactions um, and, and things and, and looking at those kind of individual patient experiences and things. Um, and what they've been doing right from the beginning, which I have to say that I applaud them for, is involving patients and the public from the very beginning. Um, and we had a report back about the, the types of engagement um, that the project has so far had with patients and the public. So that um, varied from a very deliberative democracy approach with citizens' juries, um, explaining issues to people, getting them to think and debate and, and come back, right down to an online survey mm -hmm. to, to really get kind of the headline things that people think about this. Uh, scheme as well. Um, so we were uh, very glad about getting um, updates on this stage um, and the, the, the mix of methodologies that we used uh, as well. So uh, people can ask um, issues about that. But I hope that it's also um, showing other parts of the agencies the kind of methods that we can use uh, to engage the, the public in different ways. Um, and lastly, um, which uh, came up, I think, as the board action was really uh, looking at um, how patients review uh, view risk. Um, and when we came to sort of thinking how we report back to the board on that, we realised this is quite a complex issue mm -hmm. um, with many different areas in the agency that might be affected about how patients re sort of see risk and also also how we communicate risk uh, to uh, patients and the public as well. So um, I think we had a really good discussion. I'll look at, to my fellow board members who were there. We had a very good and open discussion about um, the sorts of areas that this could co cover. Um, and really, I think the next stage is to probably scope it out properly. Um, as we plan to do, to, to see which areas are we going to focus mm. on, um, and then uh, come up with ways of maybe uh, a workshop, learning from other organisations about looking a bit more about uh, patients' appetite for risk mm -hmm. and also how we communicate it. So that was a, a very quick summary of a, a quite a, 
a long meeting, as yeah, you can tell. Right. No, thank, thank, thank you. And, and maybe, Alison, can I maybe just, just, just bring you in at this point? Obviously, our Chief Safety Officer, also a member of, the, of this particular committee, mm -hmm. just in terms of how we communicate risk, or are there any additional points you want to, uh, to mention that most is not covered? Communication of risk is a very challenging yeah. topic because it's very personal Quite. and it depends on your individual circumstance. Um, and, you know, so we, we discuss long and hard how we can do that better. You know, the patient information leaflet is, gives us information about frequency yeah. of a particular adverse drug reaction, but it doesn't necessarily tell me as an individual mm. whether I would be at more at risk or not. So there's a very big complexity yeah. about communicating that risk in, in a patient information leaflet or in other sort of patient engagement tools that we could think of. We've got a number of projects underway where we're trying to think about how we could better yeah. communicate risk and to actually then f complete the loop to understand have patients and the public understood the risks associated with the product and the benefits yeah. that they may get as well and that the benefits will be also variable across time. Um, and as maybe picking up on the yellow card biobank a bit, I think what was really interesting about that, is particularly with the citizens' jury, is the value of a really deep dive into yeah. particular topics. So we had a whole day where we could work through some of the complexities about yellow card mm. biobank, you know, about potentially returning results to people around that genomic status and the complexity of that. If you're a, if it's a ch an adverse drug reaction in a child, what would be the view of the patient of the parent, considering um, family concerns yeah. about potential genomic results, which may have implications beyond the individual, mm. concerns about data privacy and how that how we would address mm. that through the yellow card biobank. And what was very clear is allowing for those in-depth discussions was really helpful in communicating what were the issues and giving assurance to the members of the public who really we're very grateful that they gave up their time yeah. to talk through these issues and but having that time demonstrated that you that once an individual was aware of how it would be managed they felt reassured and then they would in the large majority of the individuals who were discussing this with us would be happy mm -hmm. To, um, to participate in the yellow in such a project yeah. as the yellow card biobank, but it was really useful in terms of having that in-depth discussion. And we worked also picking up on points earlier to get representativeness yes. within those citizens' jury to make sure that we did mm. have the breadth of potential uh, of uh, representative of the UK population. Yeah within those uh, participants. Mm. That's great. No, I think, I think that's great. It's a great model there. I was, I was mm. really taken with the citizens' jury uh, you know, concept and actually seeing us using it, which is, which is great. And, and Mercy, just to come back to one other thing. On, you mentioned complaints. You know, it strikes me there's a, there's a need to navigate people to the right place. W was there any recommendations coming out of the committee uh, as, as how we might potentially do that? Well, we're going to see um, the policies and procedures that now will will follow on from, you know, kind of uh, re-looking at the definition. Yeah. So as that is developed, um, I think we'll be able to comment um, a bit yeah. more about it. Because I think, I think that, that probably nicely fits with maybe Rachel's work in, in a way of, of how on, on our website we can make it really easy for people to identify if you've got this issue, you go there. If you've got this issue, you go there. Uh, yeah, so, so we make it easy for people because, you know, we need to help people, I think, in that sense. Okay. Uh, Mandy. Yeah, just picking up on the complaints. Um, I also work um, in the housing sector and the Ombudsman is very active in that area. I was wondering if there's some benefit we could do from looking across mm -hmm. sectors of where the Ombudsman's working to understand how other sectors deal with the challenges because um, they, are, they are different, but it's the complaints process. And I think the roadmap of where you go is really, really important. And so I think getting that definition of what the Ombudsman's dealing with is going to be really important for our patients and healthcare professionals and industry who would typically make complaints and it might be something we want to report to board in terms of if we do have any ombudsman complaints because it's it's normally the bigger things around processes and procedures mm. that may be lacking. I, I think that's a really good um, thing to to look at especially um, 
what we're hoping for is kind of more information about the complaints we get and obviously okay. anything that goes up to the PHSO, um, which also can take complaints from MPs directly. They mm -hmm. don't have to go through our process at all. Um, so as the process is developed and learning from um, other organisations is really important. I think one of the, the key things that we discussed at committee and we recommended is that we have an independent layperson involved at, at some stage and that the stages of the complaint is as short as possible so people aren't you know kind of pushed through stage you know 100 stages before their yeah. their issue is resolved so both of those came through yeah. uh, very strongly from the committee okay so i think it's something worth bearing in mind when we develop you know reviewing the process again but uh, paul i think you had a question and then i'll come to you ne michael next yeah, I'm very pleased to work on patient information leaflets, which I think have improved of, of old, where they seem to be just a shopping list of absolutely everything. But I think there's still quite a long way to go. Um, what's a signal separate from the placebo arm? Because still, there's just, just lots and patients can't really sort of make sense uh, sense of them. But it is difficult um, because what's important for one person may be yeah. important to not important to somebody else. Thinking about different media, I mean, people use video now rather than read. Um, and then the checking for the understanding we can learn from the consent process that doctors are trained in. Um, but my question is, how did you select the citizens' juries? That's over to Alison, really. We, we worked through a consult uh, with Newton, which is an external organisation who had who have over 100,000 people registered, and uh, they helped us select through um, a number of patients who are mm. a public rather than patient, not necessarily patients, members of the public who are happy to communicate. And that's, and that's how we, they helped us and supported us in identifying the representative selection of, of individuals. And I would say also that it was spread across the UK. So we had one in Northern Ireland, one, one system in Wales, one in England and one in Scotland. So we ensured that we had the full breadth of sort of views across the whole of the UK. Mm, great, uh, thank you for that. Michael, I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, it's just a question of clarification. It may be for Rachel. Are there any uh, investigations, any reviews being undertaken by the um, parliamentary ombudsman at the moment of any of our complaints handling? Yeah, I don't believe there are. That's, that's good. That, that's a very good message, I hope. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Graham. Uh, just to follow up on that, I think when we discussed it, we, we didn't think there was a big problem, but there was obviously a theoretical concern that there could be confusion between yellow card and, and complaints, which, yeah. is, which is something to be addressed. But I think when we looked at the website, it seemed pretty clear how you complain if you, if you wanted to. Um, and I think the main thing that we brought back is the opportunity to learn more. And I think we've picked up on that a bit, but particularly for the board to get the themes yeah. of what might be the complaints. And I think that's probably an opportunity that's not been taken fully at the moment, but it, but it can be. Yeah, well, th complaints are always a learning opportunity. Yeah, they ge genuinely are, actually. And I think uh, organisations that learn from mistakes or issues uh, and actually w strive to get better, which is what the agency wants to do, then I think that's a, a good opportunity. You want know, to come back on that, Graham? This is a separate thing, but if I could just make a comment about Yellow Card Biobank, because I, I think having not seen much about it before this, I, I, it's a very exciting project, yeah. I think. It's fantastic. And it's got a real opportunity, not only to inform science, but also engagement with clinicians and patients. And I, th yeah. and I think that the approach that's been taken is great. Um, just, just for interest, what's the thinking about patient engagement ongoing? Because clearly that's going to be a key part of what's going on with the, with the further development of it. Mm. Yeah. Alison? Well, we're still currently awaiting the funding status for the Yellow Card Biobank. And once we're, we're, that's confirmed and we're confident of that, we'll then work, walk through. But yes, we would obviously continue to engage, we would have a patient advisory group that would sit with us and work through, because there's a lot of issues to work through, particularly with genomic results and returning those results to individuals who, interestingly, through, through the patient citizens' jury, the vast majority of people did want those results returned to them. And then there's the question of interpretation and how you, how you explain what those results mean. So that's a really complex issue and something we would continue to work through with a patient advisory group as, as the yellow card biobank is established. Good, okay, Raj, final point from you. Thank, thank you. Uh, two comments really. The first one is on the public risk perception. Um, I think a good understanding for the public on how the agency makes its, its decision on risk benefit I think is really important mm. because risk benefit as we know is a ratio. 
that ratio could be different to a committee of experts looking at it and figuring out the ratio in which way it would favor versus how an individual patient or a group of patients or a sub-cohort who are with a specific condition would think. So if they can understand the former, it'll help them then identify to you what level they'd be going. And I think it's a lack of understanding the former sometimes that goes because in many ways, I think the safety decisions that the agency make comes out of recommendations from safety committees, I, yeah. I, I understand, right? In, in, in terms of it working with the agency. So understanding that process, I think, is huge. Uh, and I know with the FDA, sometimes they open it to the public. People from the public can, yeah. so they hear the debate and they hear how it's being done. So something to consider, uh, I think, Alison, uh, as we move forward. The second comment was on the Yellow Cart Biobank. I totally agree with Graham. I, it's a super exciting project, and it's so nice to see a regulatory agency going down this path of linking genetics with safety uh, 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 predictability, you know, in terms of it, I think it's going to be amazing. One thing I do want to say is, and I don't know whether it's a, it's a, it's a potential for another opportunity, is um, have you considered now, is this a right point to actually look further afield than the UK? Because there are many biobanks out there doing similar work, not as a sub, sub component of an agency, but biobanks dedicated to this. So at the European level, you have the European biobank. Then you have specific, like BBRI in, 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 um, in, the, in Europe, again, feels, deals only with neurodegeneration mm. in terms of. So there's a, quite a few resources out there. And I yeah. just wonder uh, whether we should step back, look and see which ones could help you, and actually do a link. So it's part of establishing that global international outreach as well. Because it's good then, I think, from a comms piece to even say as an agency, you're doing this. Mm. I think it's a really, you know, a, a very, how can I say, proactive, futuristic approach for a regulatory agency to be looking at this. And your resources could be much wider and you can team up and connect dots, you know, mm. with those other agencies that are out there focusing. They're not specifically focusing on safety, I think. But I think you can learn a lot from them in terms of pr processes and procedures and how they actually use it. So just a thought there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alison, just final point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that I don't believe, um, as Dan corrected, that there's any um, biobank that's specifically focused on an adverse drug reaction. So the beauty of our yellow card scheme is that we can identify individuals through our yellow card scheme who have experienced an adverse drug reaction whilst on a particular medication. We can then, with the appropriate consents, mm. contact them, and then we've got a really targeted group of individuals who have suffered that adverse drug reaction. And then where the potential, I think, might be with other biobanks is actually getting appropriate controls for, for individuals who have been on that medicine potentially and have not suffered that adverse drug reaction as a, as a potential control group, which would prevent, and you know, we will consider working with NHS England and other organizations who are collecting genomic data where we could collaborate in order not to duplicate effort. Mm. So I think that may be one area where collaboration may be useful. Mm. But I think the beauty of, our, of this particular project is to be able to target particular adverse drug reactions to understand the mechanism. Yeah. Because often, unfortunately, yeah. in patient safety, we have fairly blunt tools because we have to restrict access if we don't understand for a particular medicine for a particular patient group if we don't totally yeah. understand the mechanism underlying that adverse drug reaction. And being able to understand the mechanism will enable me to have much more targeted mm. regulatory, uh, much more targeted actions yeah. to, to ensure the benefits are there and, and that patients don't suffer harm. So, so, so I, think, I think there's a rich seam of discussion yeah. here, which I think we should maybe leave to the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee, uh, which you're a member of, Raj, so there's an opportunity to contribute further there. Um, because I, th I think actually what I'm sensing is there's a real appetite for, for discussion on the Yellow Card Biobank and actually how we can use that thinking about those international linkages and, and creating a really unique tool that's going to benefit patients. So that feels a really positive thing to do. Uh, similarly, I think actually the, the further work around the, the roadmap for complaints that was, that was mentioned as well, uh, and, and there's clearly a review of processes going on. So I think probably as far as this item's concerned right now, if we could note the report um, and, and then actually, Mercy, you know, your next meeting, continue this debate uh, and discussion of how we can make the best use of the time, I think that will be, that will be great.
Okay, is that right, Raj? I know you want to come back. But, no, no, uh, that's fine. I just want for disclosure. I wasn't able to attend the last meeting, so hence yeah. some of this might have slipped. <laughs> That's, that's, that's fine, but uh, I, think, I think it's great. Uh, anyway, thank you very much to the Patient Safety Engagement Committee for that. that that's a very rich discussion, and there's more to, more to come, is what, is what I'm hearing. Okay, moving on then to the next Assurance Committee uh, will be Organisational Development and Remuneration. And Mandy, you're the, uh, the chair of that. Um, you can assume we've read the report, but what are the key points that you wanted to bring out? Okay, thanks, Stephen. Um, well, the committee had quite a full agenda, but we did spend the uh, majority of the time looking at the recruitment of, of people to roles within the agency, as that was probably the most pressing area yep. of concern. Um, the committee uh, asked for the, uh, the numbers at that time of, of how many vacancies we had and where we were up to with the re recruiting um, into those permanent roles. And also, we had a very wide-ranging discussion looking at innovative ways, thinking slightly outside the box to get people appointed as quickly as possible. This seemed the most pressing issue for the agency. Um, as a result of that, I think we understood which roles were permanent staff, which were roles were currently filled by um, a contract staff, uh, staff on sort of the medium-term contracts, uh, and which were being, which roles were being filled by people on more temporary contracts, because clearly the agency was still fulfilling its role um, in into the public and, and patients. So we had a, a good discussion on risk and benefit of how we fill those roles with people who have the skills and to also um, reduce the number of, of people who are, are choosing to leave the re resign from the agency because of potentially the uncertainty in what they'll be doing going forward. So I think there was a great urgency reflected by the committee to, to take that action and I believe those plans are now in place to um, recruit into those permanent roles, um, particularly where we have fixed-term contract staff who have the skills to do those roles. Um, and so we, we asked for a, a review of that at the end of, of April. Um, we realised, um, I think the encouraging piece was that we could probably fill about 90% of the roles um, quite quickly. Um, and I think that made the, agent, uh, the committee feel uh, much more comfortable. Um, but obviously that action needs to be taken um, and communicated. And that was, we spoke earlier about the one agency leadership team and the importance of that group of, about communicating to them, keeping them involved and helping people through this, this time of change. Um, so we recognise there was risks as well and that there are civil service processes and one thing or another, but we felt that the, uh, the benefit has to always be are we actually be able to do our job to our, the patients and the public. Um, so we had a process to accelerate that um, and I think that was taken on board by the, mem the executive team members and we sort of, I think, felt a little bit more comfortable that the committee was sort of supporting that was the way forward. So I think we're in a much better position of filling those vacancies um, and also some way of communicating, particularly through the, um, the, the one agency leadership team and the actions that have been done on um, leadership training and development to ensure that um, leaders have the skills to work with their, their their staff team members to um, get the new organisation up and running. Um, we, we talked about, you know, where there was very specialist skills the agency didn't have, and that's very, um, we, we probably will have to recruit externally, um, but we also recognise there is a great wealth of talent within the agency, um, which we could um, redeploy. Re and people need to feel valued that their skills will be used going forward. So uh, quite, a, quite some tricky discussions, but I think, uh, I think it, was, uh, it was beneficial to uh, all of the people present. I'll just talk also briefly about the services redesign. And again, um, probably ideally, you would have, we would have looked at the services redesign uh, a little bit earlier in the transformation process. 
but we are where we are. And I think what was very encouraging that um, I think particularly in the health quality and access area, um, we're looking at ways of, of doing things differently to, um, and I think Laura mentioned some of that earlier today, in terms of taking a risk-based approach to our licensing and approvals and actually getting everybody working together. And I think one of the benefits of looking at services has been both getting people talking and thinking about how they interact with each other, looking at efficiencies, either um, because we can do perhaps more with, with less just by um, eliminating duplication, um, and, and, and enabling us also to understand what we need for our new systems going forward. So it actually ha has had a very beneficial effect, not just about defining services for what we do externally, but how we can um, do things more effectively, and importantly, how we can define our systems that's going to support us going forward for the future. Um, we also looked at the areas of uh, leadership and culture, um, which are, are very foundational. We recognise that probably um, there's, there's a good programme of work which has been designed, but unless we get people into their, their roles, the leadership and development programme can't have the biggest impact, so there's an order for doing, for doing things. But we, we felt that that was well put together. Um, and again, the honesty from the one, leadership, one agency leadership group was really important, and to continue the message about why one agency is important, how it's going to benefit patients and, and public health. Um, the other thing we discussed was <coughs> around the importance that all leaders have throughout the organisation, not just the executive team, for setting um, the vision for their groups, um, having good interactions and dialogue and getting ideas coming, uh, flowing upwards as well as, as, well as downwards. Um, and that was very encouraging that some of the leadership and development work had reached much further into the organisation. There's more work to do, but I think we're on making a good start in that, that area. Um, we also discussed briefly the internal audit, which had looked at the cultural um, work and giving limited assurance. That was largely about the governance framework which surrounded that, and that's um, we were in courage that, that the actions were being taken to give us better oversight and governance of how we um, implement the changes going forward. Um, so an awful lot, we recognise that this is a big transformation for the agency, um, but, but I think the, uh, the emphasis from the committee was to get people into their substantive roles as quickly as possible. Um, and that we've also found a way through for doing yeah. that rather than just saying do that. There was actually, the numbers began to add up and didn't look quite so daunting. Yeah, great. Well, thank you for that, uh, yeah, Mandy. Um, June, I know you sent a note out to all staff last week uh, on this very topic. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I'd like to thank Mandy and the committee for their real injection of... Um, new thinking. Mm -hmm. I think our approach now is to always look at the challenge that we're facing in the context of the benefits we're going to gain. I think that the overall our desire to follow a very fair and, and legally um, watertight process has taken too long. But with a new approach, particularly to getting our permanent staff where appropriate into roles and those in fixed mm -hmm. term roles into permanent roles, I think we're very close to getting the organisation to where it needs to be. Yeah. And the number of staff who've been deemed at risk yeah. has shrunk very quickly yeah. after the committee um, had, its, had its meeting. So we're not there yet, but the days are going by and we've given the commitment for the end of this month. Right. Okay. Colleagues, any other thoughts or questions on Mandy's report? Yeah, Graham? Just, just to clarify, so what, what is the commitment for the end of the month? That all staff, Chair, in permanent <coughs> roles will have been either put into their, if you like, new role, 
And what's really encouraging is that our staff partnership group has indicated the willingness of staff who are partially matched to look at supported or reskilling programs to take on something new. If not, that there's a rapid um, decision around uh, the at-risk status. But alongside this recruitment for the specialist roles that we're going to inevitably, with areas of new work need, we would have needed anyway, um, that that recruitment is starting and that we're using a, a newer approach to, um, to recruitment than we had previously had because that wasn't working optimally. Mm. So there's a number of strands to this, um, but from the data that are coming through, yeah. it's having an impact. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think, I think some, some con concerns were unfortunately sort of exaggerated because we were looking at permanent staff who are already employed, and many of the vacancies are currently being filled by people in a fixed-term contract or a temporary contract. So, so there are people actually doing the work, but they weren't being counted as permanent employees. And so I think actually being really clear about who's doing what role has, has, has become important. And obviously we're trying to build a fully functioning uh, organisation of full-time permanent employees. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. So we're, I think we're on track, and I, I think it feels like it's changing and improving every day. Uh, is, is, is the message that I've certainly received. Okay. Any further thoughts? Okay, well, thank you, Mandy. Let's note your report. And again, I know you're meeting again relatively soon, and you'll, you'll come back to us again with a further update in terms of uh, level of assurance you can give us on the progress. So th thank you for that. Okay, so completing our sort of uh, our third assurance committee is audit and risk assurance. So, Michael, again, you can assume that we've read the report, but uh, any key points you want to bring out? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just as a way of background, uh, we met uh, to consider four reports from Internal Audit, and Internal Audit provide the Committee with independent assurance as to the uh, effectiveness of the agency's systems, processes, and, and culture. Um, we considered four reports. As I said earlier, I'm really, really pleased about Safety Connect, which got substantial assurance, and that gives a good indication that it is likely to realise its intended benefits to enhance the agency's uh, ability to uh, protect patient safety. So that, that's a really positive result. Um, there were two reports that I, you know, that I can't shy away from. These are uh, a report on the agency's preparedness for its new trading fund status and also uh, a report on order to cash. And order to cash is really the process by which um, the agency identifies expenditure and then charges that expenditure in a fee that is recovered and becomes part of the agency's income. Both of those reports were unsatisfactory um, conclusions by internal audit. As I said, you can't shy away from that. Um, you know, an organisation should not be getting unsatisfactory reports. Having said that, I would balance it by um, the clear observation that the people in finance... Um, these are not the problems that are identified are not surprises. Um, finance know what the issue is. They know uh, what the solution is. Um, so I think we can take some assurance from that. I think the issue has got to be um, now the speed at which some of these issues can be remedied. And I would say that we have a window of opportunity of about three months uh, into this financial year when some of these problems need to be resolved. Um, they largely relate to systems. I think there are some legacy systems there and legacy ways of working that need to be resolved. And um, we have a, a, another meeting of the Audit Committee next week um, where um, Finance uh, uh, and John Fundry as Chief Operating Officer are coming back to explain um, the timetable and what action is being taken and um, what I'm used to also from a professional perspective is from time to time it is very good for an organisation to benchmark its finance function about uh, against external standards. And there are standards published by the um, central government finance service uh, and or supported by the Treasury. And what we've suggested is um, in the late summer, early autumn, um, as a committee, um, we will look at how finance um, performs against those standards. Um, I've tried to be very open and honest there, but there are some positive things about this, and I would return to them. I generally think that the people that we've got in finance are good. They know what the issues are. They need time to resolve them, uh, and I think that's, that's particularly important. 
um, talking to external audit, um, we didn't feel or we didn't get any feeling that um, the ability of the agency to produce a set of financial statements that can be audited and presented to the Parliament is at risk. Uh, I don't think that is the issue. It is rather around getting in place the right systems yeah. now and the underlying culture. And this is particularly important as we uh, set new fees um, going forward. Um, the final point I'd say is that um, there was a general degree of very good openness by the Chief Executive, the Chief Operating Officer and the Deputy Director of Finance as to the issues. Um, we discussed that it is important that in the governance statement, which is published with the annual report and is available to Parliament and other stakeholders, we set out what the issues are, but we are absolutely clear around the action that we are taking to give external stakeholders the assurance that they, that they deserve. Okay, thank you, Michael. I suppose John is uh, you know, the lead executive uh, you know, uh, uh, responsible for finance. Um, do you want to give any assurance, in, or can you give any assurance in terms of the actions that have been taken to address these issues? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Yes, happy to. Um, so I think it's worth saying, as Michael highlighted, um, you know, we asked internal audit to yep. look at audit to cash debt because we knew there were um, issues there. Uh, a lot of them, as Michael has said, are legacy and system related. Um, I think in terms of the action plan, which we'll be uh, bringing back to the Audit Risk Committee, there's probably four key um, elements to that. Uh, first of all, a clearer income and debt management policy. Uh, that will be coming to our executive committee in early June, uh, and then clearly we'll also be sharing that with our audit and risk. Um, a whole range of process improvements and training for people, both setting up invoices and collecting the debt. Uh, we've pulled in a contractor for six months yeah. um, to actually do that work. Um, some basic work on improving our customer records. So, for example, ensuring we have a purchase order when we actually start contracting for something, which aids collectability. Um, the whole area, I think, of systems improvements will actually take a longer period of time. Now, replacing um, our existing regulatory management system, I think, gives us that opportunity. And the integration with Oracle Fusion, which is our back-end accounting uh, and workforce management system, at the moment, there's a lot of manual inf interfaces yep. which are um, unreliable. Um, in the next few months, we intend to roll out some aspects of functionality which will give business people visibility of the debt yep. for their relevant areas. Once people are comfortable with that, we'll then actually uh, consider providing portal access mm -hmm. uh, for our customers. Um, and then just finally, as part of our year-end process, bearing in mind over the next two to three months, we'll be uh, working with auditors on our 21-22 uh, accounts. We will be reviewing the collectability uh, of these items and will write off any elements that we think are very, very old or un mm -hmm. uncollectible. Um, so quite a wide program uh, with, you know, uh, multiple dates, but we'll bring it, bringing that detailed yeah. plan uh, back to Michael and the committee. Great. Well, well, thank you for doing that, John, because I know, I know you are going to IRAC next week to explain that in more detail, and I'm sure, Michael, you and the committee will review that in detail. But I think it's helpful for the board just to get that overview. But so that's very helpful, John. Thank you. Um, can I just ask colleagues if there are any other specific questions on Michael's report that anyone wants to raise? Mercy. Just a comment, really, that um, when, when we look at Cumberledge in our committee, uh, we are obviously looking at the whole system as well and where we can influence it. Um, so that's a li little bit of a, uh, assurance to the board that we are looking at a wider kind of thing, just not just the MHRA, but also the partners yeah. we should be working with and influencing. Yeah, and I think, I think that's the benefit of looking at some of these, you know, really big issues from different lenses. And, and, and I think that's why, uh, you know, the two committees have actually met in the past for that very reason. So uh, I think that's very helpful. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments on the Audit and Risk Assurance Report? Okay, so I think you know I think I think that's very clear. There's some areas that are outstandingly good. So safety connect. I think you know I think as Mercy said right at the very beginning, on time, on budget. You know from from June's report through the substantial assurance that we received from there is very good. And actually personally, I'm actually very pleased to hear you know the you know the very proactive way that John and his team are actually starting to address some of the areas that were less than satisfactory. So okay, so if we can note that report with thanks, that would be great. 
So that leads us on very nicely, I think, onto the financial plans for 22-23. So, John, again, we're looking at page number 40. Um, you can assume we've read the report, um, which obviously is an overview, but uh, any comments you'd like to direct the board to? Uh, thank you, Chair. So, first of all, uh, I'll probably start with compliments to the finance team, actually, uh, who have done a very good job working with the business areas to reduce what started off as a rather substantial deficit yeah. to uh, practically break even a small pressure, uh, as you can see um, from the paper. Um, so, Exco have agreed that budget is broadly balanced, uh, 700k pressure, which we will hold centrally, and we are confident that we will be able to manage. Uh, during the year. Um, I think worth thanking our colleagues in DHSC uh, at this point for uh, the funding they've allocated through the spending review. Uh, that will enable us to continue to fund our transformation activities, but crucially, I think, um, key investment in systems. So um, within the budget, there's nine million uh, to make a start on the new regulatory management system which I think is a key enabler in a whole host of areas, uh, and completing Safety Connect, uh, as Michael and Alison have uh, highlighted. There's 1.6 million in there. Um, there's savings across a whole number of areas uh, embedded in there, um, and there's active work underway, as we know, on our fees, um, where we'll be aiming to consult uh, over the spring uh, with a view to bring, bringing in that uh, hopefully increased income from the next financial year. Um, so, pleased to recommend the budget to the board. Excellent. Well, thank you, John. I think, I think you made this uh, comment at the beginning around uh, you know, the substantial progress that's been made in, on, on this. You know, just looking at the table uh, on, on page two of the report, actually you can see the 33 million deficit that we effectively were budgeting at the last financial year. You know, and that's a direct impact of coming out of Europe, uh, you, you know, and actually having to fundamentally change our business model. And so I think a massive congratulations to the entire team, not just the finance team have, have clearly been leading on this, but actually it's, it's required collaboration right across the agency. I think I see this as a real one agency success, actually, in terms of coming together with a balanced budget. So I think that's really important because actually we now that we're no longer a trading fund, and as of the 1st of April, you know, we're within the accounting boundary of the Department of Health and Social Care, then clearly we have to manage every year within our, the budgets that were allocated. So I think that's been a, an incredible achievement. So I, I feel really pleased about that. And I just wanted to, again, make a, speci a special note of thanks, please, Natalie, in the, uh, in, in, in the minutes. So colleagues, any specific questions? I understand the executive team have already been through, through this. So I think I wouldn't necessarily expect too many questions from the executive colleagues. But Helen, I think you had one. Thank you. I, I think it's just worth giving a little context around the SR settlement. Uh, it really was an extraordinarily tight SR settlement um, this time. So the agency has done extremely well and, and really made the case effectively for the, the transformation funding that's been received. And we're delighted to see that that's, that case has been made with Treasury and, and has come through. And we look forward to being able to continue to work with you. Um, you'll also be aware that um, there may be um, OLS is still considering its options for its life sciences funding, uh, which may provide some other much more limited opportunities. But the, the really strong result, I think, around transformation. Yeah, great. Well, and, and, th and thank you, Helen, to you and your team as well uh, within the department. You know, I know that you've been helping uh, you know, steer us through this as well. So we genuinely appreciate the department's support in this. We don't it's take it for granted. It's quite a ride, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't take it for granted, you know. So uh, uh, l luckily, we don't just rely on the department for our funding. So I think that's the, that's the important thing. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Michael. Um, Again, tremendous congratulations. I'm, I'm an auditor, so forgive me my, my one element of cynicism here. John, your last statement on paragraph 3.1, the agency has also in recent years usually had a favourable performance against its budget. I think what that sometimes has been is that we haven't always spent what we've intended to spend. So my only observation I would say is that this is great. It is really, really great. But it's now in the management and delivery of this budget. And the important thing is yeah. that we really track expenditure and it, it's as close to its profile as it can be, because if we don't, we lose the money now. Yes, and exactly. that's the important risk that really does need to be managed. Yeah. But so really great, but 
But yeah. that's the thing. That John, I'm sure you'll agree. <laughs> I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, <laughs> I, I think the key area of emphasis, uh, unfortunately, you know, Claire Harrison, CIO, uh, isn't here today. Uh, but the area historically we struggled is to make those investments um, in the necessary systems. Yeah. That's critical for our ability to perform. And with the loss of fun, uh, trading fund status, as we all know, we can't carry over from year to year. So actually getting those projects underway and the money spent is key. It is completely critical, isn't it? But I, th I think the good thing is this budget allows uh, an appropriate level of funding to go into those systems. So I think this, this has always been the balance of how can we you know, invest in our systems development for the long term as well as operate the business efficiently in the short term. And we need to do both. It's not, it's not an option. And I think actually this, this budget appears to be able to achieve that. Um, John? Just one final comment, Chair, uh, which is I mentioned the fees review. Um, the other thing we will be ensuring is that we recover the costs of those systems <coughs> investments. Um, as part of our fees, which historically we perhaps haven't haven't done. Yeah. So you know we have a degree of legacy system debt. It's important that the people we're providing a service to pay for those systems that are helping provide that service, and, yeah. and we'll ensure that is the case. Yeah, I think that that does make sense. Uh, uh, Graham, you had a point. Yeah, as very much a non-auditor, uh, just a question from ignorance. So. As I understand it, I mean, there is a slight decline in income, but the explanation is that this is a one-off correction, as far as I can see. This doesn't reflect a, diff a change in, in business, essentially. Is that is that correct? And it's not. we wouldn't expect that to continue to decline. Uh, yes and no. So, you know, over the last two or three years, we've had a significant uh, decline in European income. That's been up, uh, offset by actually a far more significant increase in national applications than we were expecting. Um, so that's softened the blow, uh, if you like. Um, and we've also had the COVID impact. So, so actually, looking at our income over the next two or three years, over the last two or three years, is actually quite con uh, confusing because you, you've got EU exit and COVID happening, which, for example, impacted our inspections uh, income. So stripping that all out and determining what is business as usual yeah. is actually quite hard. So underpinning this budget, there's actually a lot more detailed analysis that does actually show that, and we'll be sharing that with Michael and his colleagues yeah. on audit and risk. Mm. But, cer but certainly bringing Laura into the conversation, because actually I think from an activity point of view, um, you know, you, what, what's the position from your perspective, Laura, on, I mean, on activity? I, I, I look at this with a whole load of risks. <laughs> it's a lovely, lovely end game, but it feels to me to be the start of the story. And um, I mean, as well as men spending on the investment in IT, we need to spend on the people, going back to our conversation yep. about recruitment as well. And we need to commit to complete and implement these service reviews because there is a lot of that top line of income is dependent on the people that we have. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about national applications, um, the applicants do have regulatory choices. They can decide to come to us or they can decide to go somewhere else and then come to us in Europe and come to us through Reliance. So I see this as a, as a great start, but we've got to keep mindful of, of spending the staff costs and, and the yeah. income as well as just the investment. So keen to, to keep doing that and complete the transformation yeah. work. But certainly at the moment, activity is also re remaining at a fairly consistently high level. They are, yes. Um, so, so, so to answer your initial question, Graham, yes. I, think, I think activity is, is relatively at least stable. You know, I think what we need to do with the service redesign is actually continue to make the UK an attractive place. Uh, and, and that comes to being able to efficiently and predictably uh, you know, deliver our regulatory uh, ap approvals and decisions. Uh, that's going to be a really important part of that. And we can only do that uh, with, uh, with highly skilled and highly motivated staff. So I think you know, that completes the circle, I think, in, in, on all of those. Um, uh, John, if, if I can, actually, there was, a, there, there was an action in Michael's report um, around confirming the resources dedicated to patient engagement. So that was, a, that was referenced in Michael's ARAC report. Um, could you just maybe just, uh, and it, it suggested we should just do that while we're talking about the budget. So is there anything you can say in terms of the amount of resources within this budget that are allocated to patient engagement? Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so within actual, uh, actually Rachel's area of comms, uh, we've got the equivalent of 18.4 full-time employees dedicated uh, to that side, uh, led by a more or less full-time mm -hmm. um, deputy director. Um, now, we also believe uh, that Glenn Wells and the partnership team will be undertaking uh, work in this space, uh, 
due to Glenn's leave, we actually haven't been able to quantify yeah. that, but there will be resource in that area. Um, so happy for Rachel to expand. If yeah, Ra Rachel, is there anything else you could you could comment on in terms of uh, you know our in financial investment in patient engagement? Well, the only thing I would add is just to highlight that obviously staff right across the agency are engaging with patients yeah. as part of their day-to-day -day role. So Correct. while the figures that John has, has um, shared are the figures for my team, yeah. actually it's much more, much more widespread yeah, exactly. um, right across the organisation. Yeah, okay. That's th th thank you for that clarification. Okay, any final points? June, I always like to come to you last at an occasion like this. Is there any reason why the board should not approve this budget? None. Um, it's been a real uh, like exercise in integrated working right across the executive and uh, pay tribute to John's team and the deputy director who've really engaged very actively to get us to this point. Um, the executive committee, when we looked at it, um, thoroughly kicked it around, as you would expect, and uh, are fully behind it. But the message we're taking today, and I'm sure uh, we all are, is make sure we work this budget very actively, spend what we need to spend, particularly on our new yeah. systems. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I know, Laura, you, you, you've made some comments around the need to deliver on that. Mark, can I just come to you and sort of ask for your commitment to this budget? I'm totally committed to this budget. One of the um, key things you'll see here is support for the South Moon site yes. as the infrastructure. And I know that um, team working under John is working very hard uh, to actually address that, also to improve our scientific capital spending and, as we've mentioned before, staffing. So, yes, it's, um, it's going to be demanding to get used to the new way of delivering everything within a year, but mm -hmm. I think we will do it. Yeah, great. You know, because again, I know concerns have been expressed previously around our our, our commitment to both you know, the site at South Mims, yeah, you know, the activities and statutory responsibilities, and our scientific research. So you remain convinced that we've got the funding to do that. Always welcome more funding for research, chair. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we can do it. Uh, I, I knew that would come. Uh, and, and Alison, can I just check from a safety perspective? You know, uh, how comfortable are you with the level of funding that we've currently got in this budget? So comfortable with the level of funding for Safety Connect. Obviously, that's an absolutely key um, underpinning uh, infrastructure for me in safety and surveillance. And also will support some of that patient engagement yep. with the new platforms to feed information back to patients on the products that they're taking. So I think that's a really key, um, key piece of work. Obviously, like, like Mark would always welcome more. But and you already mentioned you got your pitch in for yellow card by a bank. <laughs> Continue to work with the external yeah. community as well, yeah. and our colleagues in DHSC and Department of Health and NHS Digital to to ensure that we capitalise on all of the innovation that's that's ongoing Correct. in the wider health ecosystem. And I think that's really important that we work together to uh, to reduce duplication yeah. of effort uh, and and leverage the really some of the really exciting work that's mm. going on in, in NHS uh, in England and improvement. Around yeah. Safety and some yeah. of the sort of point of care traceability for devices that's been ongoing. So, looking to leverage that work. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, thank you, colleagues. I think that seems like a ringing endorsement from the executive team. So, uh, as a board, are we happy to approve this budget formally? Excellent. I'm seeing everyone nodding around the table. So, uh, Natalie, if we can just record in the minutes that the board approves the proposed budget. So, thank you to everyone who's been involved in putting that together. That leads us, leads us on to the last substantive item on the agenda, which is around how can we provide more opportunities for public engagement uh, with the agency. Um, and Rachel, I think uh, you've actually uh, helped to uh, write this report on, on, on behalf of June. Uh, we're looking at page sort of number 44, I believe, in the pack. So again, you can assume we've read it, but any key points you want to bring out? Yes, thanks very much, Chairman. So, um, as uh, you can see from the paper, and actually I think also from the various discussions we've had this morning, we've had a very significant increase in our patient and public engagement activity over the last year. Um, that year has seen the publication of the new patient involvement strategy, which we are well on the way uh, to implementing, but there is more to do. So this is a kind of status report really for the board in terms of where we are at the moment. 
you can see some examples of uh, some of the activities we've done over the last year, um, including piloting citizens' juries with the Yellow Card Biobank, um, holding our first uh, public hearing as a pilot on isotretinoin, um, overhauling our approach to consultation, and indeed continuing to hold all of our board meetings in public. And just on consultation, I thought the board might like to know that for the, the recent clinical trials consultation, we had a record number of over 2,000 consultation responses, and 47% of those were from patients and the public. So um, that's, that's a very high response, but I'm sure uh, future consultations will be even higher. So as I say, good progress over the last 12 months and more to do. Um, what we want to do to continue to build on what we've achieved is to do some um, work with patient groups. Again, looking at how we build our approach further, uh, particularly looking at groups and demographics where perhaps we uh, have less engagement at the moment, again, building on the work we've done with um, Yellow Card Biobank. Uh, so it's very much next stages of developing our engagement approaches. And um, as you would expect, we are planning to work closely with uh, colleagues on the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee in, in doing that. I'm happy to pick up any points. Great. Okay. Well, I think that's a, a, a very self-explanatory paper, I think, in, in, in lots of ways. Really important. Mercy, you know, typically as uh, I would often come to you first on a, on, on a patient safety or engagement opportunity. Um, any, any observations or questions from you? Um, just observations, really. Obviously, patient involvement strategy, uh, which we signed off last year, is coming back to um, my committee to, to see how systematically we're delivering on it. And this is a really good indicator yeah. of where we're going. So that's really pleasing. So obviously, we're looking at learning from patients, co-designing, transparency all these issues are really important and um, and what's quite good about this paper is giving us some concrete examples of where this is happening within the agency obviously my committee is, is um, looking much more about how you know systemically um, the organization is is delivering on on patient engagement and and uh, involvement uh, and moving from just who we're reaching and how we're reaching them but actually having it so part of what the agency does so really I, I love the kind of the listening bits where where patients are going to be you know talking to staff directly um, also um, I've noted um, over the, the the year that we've been around, how uh, patients end up, for instance, on the steering group of ILAP. That's mm -hmm. a really a good point um, as well. So we're seeing some really concrete uh, areas where, where patients are being much more involved. Um, and uh, so I'd, I'd like to see how uh, this is then implemented more. And certainly as we're doing kind of more patient... Um, safety, he public hearings on patient safety issues. I think it's been really interesting and we're going to hear back about the learning we've had um, uh, on that so far, but actually it, involving more of those um, and having more of those is going to be quite interesting. So my overview is that it's moving in the right direction, mm -hmm. keeping a very close eye on it, obviously, but it's nice to see some really concrete examples as well. Okay. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's great. Um, uh, Rachel, just, just one question from me first, if I, if I may. On, on Section 4.1, there's the table around public patients, <laughs> reporting patients and involved patients. You know, I'm, I'm assuming they're not mutually exclusive in the fact that people could actually be in more than one of those groups. So there may be a situation where they want to report an incident, but then also want to get involved in a working group you know, or, or just a, a, a general public engagement opportunity. So just for that clarity. Yes, absolutely. And uh, as well as people potentially being involved in more than one of those groups, they could move between groups yeah. over time. So uh, starting with um, a little about what we do and yeah. where we are, but then they might want to report something. So it's it's moving up and down those uh, three levels as well as potentially um, being part of more than yeah. one of them. Uh, and and, and how, how would members of the public actually identify how they can get involved with one of these areas? Yeah, so there's uh, some comprehensive information on our website about how to contact us and how to get involved and very much welcome uh, people coming forward. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, J J Junaid, I think you had a question. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for the report. I just wonder if you could 
shed, shed any light around representation and EDI. So when we think about the broad representation of who we're trying to access, there's clearly health literacy challenges across the wider population. Perhaps some populations are more affected by it than others. And so as we think through our approach to this, I would just like assurance that we're also thinking about the EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion and gender more broadly as we think about patient and public agenda engagement in this process. Yes, absolutely, we are. And um, Mercy, I, I, you may want to say something about the joint meeting uh, that we are planning before the summer with um, Mercy's committee and Mandy's committee to look at that very issue. I'd, I'll just comment on that because I am the lead for EGI for the, the board as well. So obviously um, an issue uh, very close to my heart. And we interrogate every single paper, as you can imagine, that comes to us uh, for kind of who we're reaching and the, and the groups we're not reaching um, as well. Uh, yes, we're having a, a joint committee that uh, the patient safety uh, and engagement committee is also meeting with the organisational development and Re remuneration committee, uh, looking at, uh, as I would summarise, the internal and the external mm. on EDI. Um, so what we're doing internally for staff, but also externally who we're reaching and how we're reaching them and how we're doing it in a systematic <coughs> way and how we're improving uh, that outreach and, um, and uh, improving internally as well. Uh, for those messages to, to come across. Um, obviously, we will um, keep the board um, apprised of that in terms of, uh, you know, kind of uh, statistics and other um, data that we mm. can we can uh, find uh, as, as that changes over time as well. Um, also, uh, I don't know if the board is aware that... Um, the, the chair and I are also part uh, of an arm's length body EDI um, group uh, too that looks across a number of NHS organisations, including NHS England, um, that uh, come together to really share good practice and to uh, to actually uh, help each other uh, as well in these these areas too. So it's not just. Um, us as an agency mm. that's looking at this, but we're also learning and, and helping uh, each other across uh, arm's length bodies too. Yeah. Janae, is that... A, yeah, no, you very helpful. Uh, perhaps just linking an additional agency. The health observatories, I think, are really, really good organisations for us to loop into, and I think the work that they've done during the pandemic yeah. around engaging the wider population would be a group that we should uh, consider looking into mm. as well. And I think I think Mercy, another perspective would also be don't just let. We've got to be aware that as a proportion of our population are not digitally enabled, so putting all our information on the website automatically doesn't get to we, everybody. We review that every single time. Yeah. I I think uh, my fellow uh, PSEC committee members um, yeah. always kind of uh, raise that um, online or not online. And in fact, the Yellow Card Biobank um, did specifically yeah. uh, look at that issue as well and 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 what because i know from an nhs perspective we're looking at population health yeah, yeah much more systematically yeah. you know and actually some of our most deprived communities yeah, yeah. have got the greatest health needs and actually often got the least access uh, to uh, ability to contribute to these things so uh, I, th I think actually specific actions around that will be will be helpful you know when, when you think about that mercy because just just ac acknowledging the fact that we haven't we, some parts of the population are not digitally enabled doesn't solve the issue. So what are the actions that we're going to take to address that, I think, is probably the next follow-on question to that. But, uh, Paul, I know that's something that you feel very strongly about, too. Absolutely. Um, I mean, my question was, in terms of the, if we look at all of the patient contacts and queries, how many of those are solely MHRA-related? How, how much is... MHRA, but other aspects of the health system as well, and how much is outside of MHRA? And is there a forum to address whole systems issues? Uh, how do we pull in the other stakeholders? Rachel, is there? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the majority of the um, questions we get are for the MHRA, but many of them do relate to other players in the system as well. So we have very good links with their, uh, with um, patient involvement networks across the system. There's a, there's an arm's length body patient engagement network, which we are part of. And so that is of often a very useful channel. I mean, as you would expect, we do also get 
uh, questions and comments from members of the public that are for other organisations and are something that we're not involved in. So the customer service centre team are very good at signposting on to the appropriate organisations and handing over to them if, if that's needed. So it is a bit of a mix, um, but primarily um, they are uh, uh, either for us or for us as part of the system. Yeah, if, if, if I think back to the Cumberledge review, uh, you know, that was about a, a healthcare system in its entirety that wasn't as joined up as, as well as it could be. And, and, and so therefore, if, if we keep doing, trying to solve the issues organisation by organisation, there might be some things that don't actually get properly resolved. Uh, and, and I just wondered whether we can sometimes maybe think about using our convening capability if there was a particular issue that was coming through that isn't going to get fixed just by one organisation on their own or us passing it on to another organisation to fix. I, I, I'm not sure I haven't got any examples specifically, but I think that's something we need to be aware of and use our uh, an ability to actually work with several uh, other uh, arm's length bodies at the same time to try and fix issues if we, if we identify them. Alison? Yeah, I'm going to say there are examples where we do that. For example, Safer Medicines in Pregnancy Perfect. and Breastfeeding Consortium, which is a broader range of health, uh, health partners yep. to try and address specific issues there. Yep. We have, of course, we have the Valprate Stakeholder Network where we're addressing issues related to Valprate and looking to do something similar for isotretinoin. So there are specific examples where Good. we take forward um, that wider picture, I guess, what you're looking for is that more systematic yeah. way that we do it, which we yeah. do it. Because that, does that get, the, does that get to the number of the problem, Paul? It does, yeah, because I just don't have a sense for how effective that is at the moment. And, and I've got a good idea about MHRA, but not about other bodies. Yeah. Um, and we can maybe just pass things over and actually mm. it's not really working. Yeah, so I think we have to keep working at that, I think is probably the, the, the message. Mandy? We yeah, sort of building on that theme a little bit, but also how we're... Um, making industry accountable as well, as they're wanting licences. If they, if they haven't done the cons consultation or having clinical trials which are fully representative of the populations, how can we actually build that into um, the processes for mm. approval? Because I think there's got to be a burden back there in terms of, or a responsibility yeah. back into how we get licences and making sure we really understand the risk benefit of medicines. Yeah, it's taking it beyond ticking a box, isn't it? It is. And I think I think we can also be very helpful to say how you can do that. And I I love starting to do that, but I think you know there's it takes a lot of money to develop a drug. This mm. is actually relatively small amounts of money, um, but actually could have a huge impact and the ongoing mm. responsibility that um, the license holder has, I think, is very important. Yeah, and, and, and June, that's something I know you feel strongly about too. Well, it would be impossible to overstate the importance of taking a systematic look, yeah. as we're now enabled to across the life cycle, of not just encouragement, but triggers and making things mandatory, plumbing them in mm. to a process when you know that systematic approach will be taken. I think the other aspect of the conversation needs to be around making it meaningful, mm -hmm. which is actually then showing that we have valued and used and incorporated and built on patient contribution. Um, it's multifaceted, and I can see this delivering ultimately a framework for a systematic approach where for either different um, groupings, as we've seen here, although they're not mutually exclusive, uh, different stages in a product life cycle, we'll have preferred tools that we will use and not have to reinvent when a valprate comes along or an isotretinone, or oh, let's think of something different that the system kicks into gear. We do have good examples of where organisations come together, but there isn't a lot of glue between it, I have to say. And the beauty of regulation, if you can use that word, is that we can use the force of a legal step that actually triggers other action. Mm. And that's where I think Andy's coming in, that we shouldn't hesitate, actually, from time to time to show that the patient contribution has actually enabled that legal step to be taken as the Pregnancy Prevention Programme for Valparate is. So I think there's a lot more to do, but the co-design phase is going to be the exciting phase because what we think will make this meaningful mm. is only what we think, and it's actually 
for patients and the public yeah. to be telling us what their journey, their interaction with us needs to be like for that experience to be one they felt was productive and worthwhile and it had a, had a difference. And capturing some of that altruism that we see not just from those that sign up for clinical trials, which is incredible uh, during COVID, but people who simply say when it's an adverse reaction, I want you to know about this because I don't want someone else to have gone through that uncertainty and that um, journey that I've been through. So let's, this is so worthwhile. And uh, I really think to give it the huge support that it mm. needs to turn it into the meaningful outcome-based um, uh, set of tools that we will yeah. use systematically. Great, okay, thank you. And, and, and Raj, you, just, from, just from your perspective, I can see you've got your thinking face on. I can see that <laughs> without putting your hand up. It's that obvious, huh? Um, <clears throat> it's really picking up what Mandy said about industry. I think it's a really good idea to engage them because a lot of this shouldn't start in the life cycle management. It should actually start during the development phase yeah. because that will give you the baseline for safety once you get into life cycle management yeah. in terms of it. So then the question is, how do you do this in a meaningful way, as June says? You've got to, I think, involve patients developers and yourselves and I think that's how you, if you do that then it becomes more meaningful all parties because at the end of the day data will come from the developers yeah. right and that's what that's the basis of your evidence to make decisions but then patients can be part of that data shaping I think it's a good time because industry is also I, you know in different platforms I'm, I'm reading that they are involving patients because it's not just in the UK other agencies and other platforms are also wanting patient engagement in. So I think it's a good time. But I really like the idea of regulations being a beauty because that's the mandate, June, that you're talking about. It's, it's not optional. It needs to be done, okay? But we also then have to be careful in making the mandate uh, uh, facilitated at this stage because it's early. It's the first time companies will be doing it. So they will have queries, they will. So you need to make sure you provide clear guidance I always, say, I always think regulators tell you what's needed and industry figures out how to take the what and plan, implement it, right? So you need to give some guidance around the what is needed to make sure it's meaningful. Uh, and I think if we approach it that way, particularly in the early stages, while people get the experience and the way how to do mm. it, then this becomes a component of your development plan, yeah. which is your clinical trials really yeah. coming in. So just a thought there. Mm. Yeah, I think that makes Great. a lot of sense, doesn't it? So, yeah. Graham, you had a point. Yes, question really. I mean, I, I, it's a fantastic body of work that's going on, I think, and I think that should be should be noted. And I suppose my concern is that I don't see many of my clinical colleagues with a very strong engagement with MHRA or understanding of MHRA. And I don't know whether you would agree with that um, and whether you would see a patient involvement strategy as having that as a necessary part. I would assume, and it may not be true, that most patients are engaging with the system through their care provider, be that a doctor or a pharmacist or whoever. And are we addressing that enough, do you think? Rachel? Yeah, thank you. So I th absolutely agree um, for most patients. Uh, it's their interface with the healthcare professional that is where yeah. they get their information, their advice, and, and that's where the relationship is. Um, we feel that we need to do more with healthcare professionals, and we're actually about to launch a consultation with healthcare professionals um, and with professional bodies around how best we can engage and communicate so that we can make sure that um, you know, what, we're, what we are delivering is, is delivered in the best way for healthcare professionals. It helps them have the conversations with patients and... Um, effectively to take action on our recommendations uh, to making sure that that our um, advice for healthcare professionals goes through so we're we're just finalizing the the details of that consultation at the moment we're expecting to launch it in sort of May June um, and rather like we did with the patient involvement strategy we will then take the results of the consultation and develop our healthcare professionals uh, strategy from there I mean, that's really great to hear. And just, I mean, how broad do you see that going? Because I guess one of the things we've learned, particularly through COVID, has been the range of healthcare professionals that have influence on patient decisions. 
yeah. So uh, uh, we see it as being very broad. Um, uh, you know, it's it's not uh, not something where there's um, just a few professional bodies, for example, where we would want to engage. We want to um, both uh, give. Um, professional bodies and individual clinicians the opportunity to respond. Um, we're going to have a range of things like some focus groups in different areas with different professional groups so that we can really um, get under the skin of what's needed rather than it just being at, at quite a, a, a high level. So uh, very happy to share the d more detailed plan around um, how we're going to do that. Presumably that will go through Patient Safety and Engagement Committee too at some point? Yeah, Patient Safety and Engagement Committee actually has had um, discussions yeah, about this already and has very much informed the approach we're taking. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And, and, and also, I think the widest, you know, the widest representation again, I think is important. So it's not necessarily medics. I think about nursing staff, think about pharmacists, think about other allied healthcare professionals as well, because actually, you know, number of those uh, individuals have crossovers with the use of medicines or medical devices in the, in the broadest sense. And I think one of the learnings for me from COVID was the importance of midwifery in, in some yes. of these decisions when we talk about valparate and making sure that we're engaging those groups well yeah. and, and, and visitors and so the list goes on. And important it? issues of EDI as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. All right. So I think there's been, you know, a number of comments there. Any further thoughts in terms of providing, Rachel, any further direction on this area of public engagement? Yeah, Hayda. Thank you, Chair. Just a, a few observations and, and echo everyone else's comments on, on uh, how great it is to see so many different touch points here. Um, I noted in 3.8 uh, the use of um, patient-led content to increase awareness, and I thought that was that was really, really good. It made me think of our staff as well. Sorry, it was to increase awareness amongst our staff, but patient-to-patient -patient communication could also be quite powerful. Um, uh, and, and the only other minor comment was um, the five-minute length of that video. Um, you know, we could also cut that down to increase accessibility. I mean, I think people generally will watch a kind of one- to two-minute video in most, in most cases and shy away from anything longer, but just really minor point. Um, and then the last thing I thought um, was, uh, and I think Paul was kind of um, going in this direction, to have a, a dashboard or a, um, an infographic maybe of all the different touch points that we have as an agency um, with our patients and you know, potentially healthcare professionals as well, I think would be really interesting and help us maybe spot some gaps um, that, that we could tackle. So just a few observations. Yeah, th th thank, thank you for that, Hayda. I, I must be having been involved with the MHRA for, what, five years now. You know, the difference in terms of the level of times we talk about patients and public engagement, you know, from before C uh, Cumberledge Review to after in the last sort of two years is, is just you know, light years apart from, from my perspective, just as a, as, as a layperson. And, and, and so I think actually there are some great examples here and I, yeah, I sense the enthusiasm that the, the, the board has got for this particular area, you know, and, and I think we do have to make it real and meaningful, you know, and so I think how we work systematically, you know, as a regulator, you know, with our sort of, uh, you know, developer and industry partners as they actually, you know, bring forward new products to the market becomes, you know, vitally important. You know, I've heard a very strong desire to make sure we've got good representation. So that's, that's equality, diversity, and inclusion. You know, it, it's all three of those lenses. It's not just about ticking a box. I think it, it, it's got to be, again, be meaningful. And, and, and I think actually, particularly the discussion we've just been having about healthcare professionals in the broader sense. You know, this, this is where, again, I think we can use our influence uh, you know, you know, really quite systematically here. And so I think that's going to be a really important part of work. But this is something that will never be over, and it's something that uh, it, it's, it's part of our mission uh, to, to continue to engage to make sure that the products that are used in the UK market are, you know, are not only safe, they're relevant, uh, understood, and, and, and can be used uh, effectively. So there's a whole range of things there. I think that this this comes up. So I think we can support. Uh, you know, the, the proposed, uh, you know, direction of travel, which is what this is. This is not a, a plan for approval. This is actually the direction that we're moving. So thank you, Rachel, to you and your team. Please keep up the good work, I think is what I would say. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, so that brings us to the end of the, uh, the substantive board papers. Um, so uh, as I said at the, at the beginning, we're, we're looking to take questions now. I, I know we've had a number of pre-submitted questions. Um, 
but actually they weren't d directly related to the agenda per se. So uh, the questions that have been pre-submitted uh, will be answered in writing. Uh, that's, that will be the, the way we'll approach that. So everyone who's raised a question will get an answer. Um, during the chat, can I just check, or during the meeting, Rachel, have there been any questions related to the agenda points that we've been discussing? Yes, there's a couple of questions that have come through the chat this morning that um, we okay. could pick up. So the first one um, relates back to the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee report. And uh, the questioner is asking, what influence does the agency have on ethics questions? Um, for example, for people with incurable neurodegenerative diseases, um, they may be willing to take more risks when it comes to new experimental treatments than perhaps the, the patients themselves are given credit for. So a really question about um, influence of the agencies on those, some of those ethics questions. Yeah. Well, I know that was part of the discussion that was held at PSEC, but maybe June, can I ask you to comment first? We work closely, first of all, with the Health Research Authority yeah. in particular so that their formal role in reviewing ethics when it comes to trials sits alongside our review of safety, um, quality and efficacy. So it's about getting minds aligned. I think the questioner does blur the boundary talking about risk acceptance and the ethics around that. Um, our committees are well advised if they need to step outside quality, safety and efficacy, but in the end, the regulatory decision on that is going to be informed, I think, by the patient views yeah. that come forward at that time. So it is an issue that we want to look at further. We heard from the PSEC report um, that Mercy was uh, describing how we'd like to have more of a workshop around these mm -hmm. issues. So I'd really just say that we have our legal remits, but we're very alert and listening mm -hmm. to other concerns and would like to develop possibly yeah. a better interface so that we're not seeing the two worlds totally yeah. separately. And, and just thinking about the role of the Patient Safety Engagement Committee, um, then obviously you, you, the, our Board Assurance Committee is not making regulatory decisions, but it's actually trying to gain assurance on the processes. Uh, but Mercy, is there anything else you want to add in terms of uh, the way you've been approaching this? Um, yes, just to back up what June was sort of saying, I mean, I, th I think our dilemma was about the, the remit of the, the agency and what we could do. Um, but think through how perhaps risk is communicated yeah. as well as how risk is used in our decision making. Um, but because it's such a rich area, and we did talk about ethics committees actually um, in, in part of our discussion, that's why we really need to scope very carefully uh, what we want to really look at in more depth and, and, and do things like uh, workshops and seminars yeah. and some sort of engagement process so we can really think through um, the implications of this, because the, the worst thing is that we we go we launch into something and then actually we can't really do much with it or yeah. deliver it because it's not up to to us to do it. Um, so to to think through with others would be a really good idea. Yeah. Okay, and, and and Alison, just thinking about practically how you know. When, you, when you're making the, the risk and benefit discussions, as you said earlier, uh, you know, you know what, what role do ethics uh, play in that, do you think? Um, you should press the button, button as well. Yes, I was just pondering on the, on the question, actually, and yeah. I actually wrote down understanding benefits yes. in the context of risk, especially in the context of an unmet medical need, is really key because unless you have that benefit yes. balance, balanced against the risk for an individual but it's it's really complex especially in yeah. unmet need because you're often coming down to an almost individual yeah. level which is a conversation between the patient and the healthcare uh, provider and what's our role I see in that is to make sure we provide the information in as mm. clear a way as possible so that that to inform that discussion yeah. and, and have the tools yeah. available to to make sure the patient is fully informed. Yeah well I think that links directly back mm. to the conversation we've been having mm. about healthcare professionals yeah. because actually in terms of it will be an individual discussion yeah. so patient information leaflets that we've already mentioned need to be appropriate you know healthcare professionals need to be engaged in that and, and we can provide a framework so. Yeah. Because I was actually, just to build on that, thinking about that in terms of Rachel's patient engagement, obviously where an individual is in their disease process yep. influences their perception of risk. And I think it's really important that when we think about inpatient engagement, we think about the mindset of the yep. 
patient and how they might understand information given to them depending on where they are in their disease process, if they're depressed, yeah. if they have anxieties okay. or other issues, we need to make sure all of that comes yeah. through in our engagement. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Rachel, was there another question? Okay, so the next one um, is uh, relating to the last of the papers on the agenda, and it, uh, the question is whether we ask medical charities if members want to be engaged with patient involvement and with um, the MHRA. Do you know the answer to that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was rather thinking I could answer it as well as ask the question. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, we, have, we have very good relationships with many of the medical charities. Of course, there are a large number of charities, so um, we are always working to build relationships with them. And I think particularly um, where colleagues are considering um, products from a particular disease area, we, we work very closely with medical charities to make sure that we get involvement from patients um, who are suffering from those different um, illnesses and diseases yeah. in. So, so absolutely, yes. Okay, absolutely, yes. Okay. <laughs> Was there another question? And um, the last question um, that I've, I've seen um, is uh, what impact will losing trading fund status and uh, the recovery of, of the cost of systems have on fees charged to industry? Okay, John, so work in progress, I suspect. Uh, yes, it is. So as I said earlier, we're undertaking a review of our fees with the intention of having uh, that review implemented with effect from April 23, so next financial year. I mean, it's worth saying that we are bound by HM Treasury's managing public money, which basically <coughs> says we need to recover the costs of our services, including, as I said earlier, um, the cost of the necessary systems. Yeah. So that work and analysis is well underway. We will be consulting on it, uh, and that will underpin uh, basically the whole, yeah. the whole exercise. And we should also probably point out we haven't raised fees for some considerable time. Well, in fact, the last time was six or seven years ago before I joined the agency, uh, and it was a reduction. Mm. Um, so at the risk of managing uh, expectations, I wouldn't expect it to be a reduction this time. <laughs> No, uh, but, I, but, I, but I think I, I, the, the, the serious point is we do need to be able to uh, you know, m m manage the regulatory activities effectively uh, and we need to effectively uh, you know, charge fees accordingly uh, to, to recover that cost. But we're running very hard to be as efficient as we can, as effective as we can. Okay. So uh, do I take it that was the last question? Yes, so that concludes the questions that are on the substantive papers on today's agenda. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that, and uh, thank you to everyone who's been uh, observing the, the meeting today. Uh, as I said, uh, everyone who's uh, raised a, a question on a different topic will actually answer those questions in writing, uh, and, and you have that as a commitment from us. Um, just before we close the meeting, uh, I would just like to sort of uh, say a couple of quick words about uh, one of our members, and that's John Fundry. So uh, th this will, in fact, be John's last uh, board meeting of the, of, of the MHRA because he's had a career development opportunity in the government legal department. And they're not exactly words I would have thought went together, <laughs> however. But, uh, but John, actually, you've been with us for the best part of five years, uh, and uh, we really appreciate your support. So good luck in your new role. I think you're starting from the beginning of next month, I believe. Uh, yes, I am, from 1st of May. Um, so my best wishes to everybody. Uh, I think when I started this, I don't, wasn't anticipating uh, both EU exit and COVID as development opportunities uh, during my time here, but um, it has been constantly entertaining. <laughs> well, thank you for that. So as we just record our thanks to John uh, in, in, in a minute. So that, will, that will be appropriate, I think. So I think that concludes uh, the, the meeting as far as uh, today is concerned. Um, so I would just like to thank all the staff in the agency who have contributed to the production of the papers. I would like to thank uh, colleagues from communications team and also the governance office for their support in setting up today's meeting. Uh, so thank you for that. And just finally, I'd like to remind everybody uh, about the purpose of the MHRA and what we're really trying to achieve, which is fundamentally to protect and to improve patient health. And we're going to continue to do that by enabling scientific innovation for accelerating patient access to, uh, to new and effective and safe products, and also to continue to strengthen our sa patient safety and surveillance systems. We want to do that in partnership and with patients at the centre of everything that we do. 
So with that in mind, I'd like to close the meeting. Uh, thank you for your time and say have a good day. Thank you and goodbye.